In this lecture, we'll talk about the matrix of a linear transformation. So let's refresh our memories about what a linear transformation is. So a linear transformation is a, any function from Rn to Rm that satisfies these two properties, where t of u plus v equals t of u plus t of v, and where t of cu, where c is a scalar and u is a vector, is c times t of u. We know that any matrix transformation is a linear transformation, and in this lecture we'll learn that in fact every linear transformation is a matrix transformation. To get there, we need to talk about something called standard basis vectors. So when we talk about Rn, we have n of these standard basis vectors. So in R2, we have two standard basis vectors, which are the vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1. And the notation here is that we call them lowercase e. So e1 and e2 are the two standard basis vectors in R2. The standard basis vectors in R3 are e1, e2, and e3, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And so in general, the standard basis vector e sub j has 1, 1 in it in the jth position, and then zeros everywhere else. Now, notice that we're using the same notation here. So e1 is the vector 1, 0 in the context of R2, and e1 is 1, 0, 0 in the context of R3. So the context here matters. So if you ever see something like e sub 2, you need to know which Rn that's living in so that you know exactly what that vector looks like. Now these standard basis vectors are useful because if we happen to know what our linear transformation t does to those standard basis vectors, we can use that information to figure out what t does to any vector using the linearity of t. So how's that going to work? Well, t of negative 3, 5 here, we can think of that as t of negative 3 times the basis vector e1, 1, 0, plus 5 times the basis vector 0, 1, e2. So now since t is linear, we can break this up. This is going to be negative 3 times t of 1, 0, and then plus 5 times t of 0, 1. They give us what t of 1, 0 and t of 0, 1 is. So this is negative 3 times the vector 4, negative 1, 2, plus 5 times the vector 0, 2, 3. And now we just need to multiply and add. So we get negative 12, positive 3, negative 6, and 0, 10, 15. And when we add those together, we get negative 12, 13, 9. So notice how we used the linearity of t together with the knowledge about what t does to those standard basis vectors to figure out what t does to this arbitrary vector, negative 3, 5. Similarly, we can use a matrix to figure out easily what a matrix multiplied by one of these standard basis vectors is. So when we multiply this matrix by E2, first of all we need to know which Rn does E2 live in. Well, in order to multiply this matrix A by a vector, since A has four columns, the vector that we multiply by has to have four entries. Because remember, what the vector is telling us is what are the coefficients of the linear combination of the columns that we are putting together here. So E2 here has to be within R4, which means it's got a 1 in the second position. That's what the subscript 2 tells us. And the fact that it has to have four entries, that's how we know that it has to be in R4. Now when we multiply this out, remember, this is telling us to take a linear combination of the columns of A. So this is going to be 0 times the first column of A plus 1 times the second column of A, plus 0 times the third column of A, plus 0 times the fourth column of A. But all of those zeros are going, to, are going to go away, and so we just end up with the second column of A, negative 1, 4, 3. So we multiply A by E2, and what we get is the second column of A. So similarly, a times e3 would give us the third column of a, a times e1 would give us the first column of a, and so on. So putting these two ideas together gives us this theorem. It says that when we have a linear transformation, there exists a unique matrix a such that t of x is really just a times x for all x in Rn. In other words, every linear transformation is a matrix transformation, and we can figure out exactly what that matrix is it's the matrix whose columns are just t of the standard basis vectors.
Okay, so we have to prove this theorem. Now we have two things to prove. We've got to prove that t of x is always just a times x, where a is that matrix whose columns are t of e1, t of e2, and so on. And we have to prove uniqueness. We have to prove that there's no other matrix that could do that. So our first goal, goal number one here, is to prove that t of x equals ax for all x. So if we want to prove it for all x, we say, well, let's suppose somebody hands us an x, and let's make sure that t of x works out to be what we think it should. So if x is in Rn, and we write x as its entries, little x1, x2, through xn, notice that that vector x can be written as a linear combination of the standard basis vectors. Because what this is here is just x1 times the vector e1, which is 1 and then 0 is everywhere else, x2 times e2, that's 0, 1, 0, and then zeros everywhere else, and so on, all the way up through xn, which is zeros all the way up until the very last entry, which is going to be a 1. So remember, our goal is to prove that t of x is a times x. So what is t of x? Well, when we write x as that linear combination, this is how we're going to use the linearity of t. We know from what we talked about about linear transformations in the previous lecture, that that breaks up into x1 times t of e1 plus x2 times t of e2 and so on, all the way up through xn times t of en. And that's again using the linearity of t. So a times x is just also a linear combination of the columns of a. And the columns of a are just t of e1, t of e2, and so on. So notice that this and this are the same. And so that's how we know that t of x equals a times x. So now the second thing we have to prove for this theorem is the uniqueness. We have to prove that not only does the matrix A that we talked about work, but no other matrix B would possibly work. So the way that we're going to prove this is to suppose that we did have another matrix B, so that T of X is B times X. It, again, if you think about it, it could be reasonable, like why couldn't you have two matrices that define the same function here? But if we write B1, B2 through Bn for the columns of B, what does T do to the standard basis vectors? Well, t of ej, that's going to be b times ej. And as we talked about before, when you multiply a matrix by a standard basis vector, what you get is that column of the matrix. So if we're multiplying by the jth standard basis vector, what we get is the jth column of b. But b sub j is the jth column of b, but t of e sub j is the jth column of a. And that means that a and b have the same columns. Well, that means they're the same matrix. So we really didn't find a different matrix. A and B were really the same matrix, and that proves that A is unique. That's the only matrix that works. Because, again, if we thought we had a different matrix, it turns out that that supposedly different matrix is actually the same matrix as what we started with. So there can't be a different matrix. We only have the one matrix A. So now that we know that any linear transformation has one and only one associated matrix, we have a name for that matrix. We call it the standard matrix for the linear transformation T. And we can fully define any linear transformation simply by knowing what does that linear transformation do to the standard basis vectors. And this allows us to define some new transformations. We can define, for example, a transformation that represents a 60 degree counterclockwise rotation about the origin. That turns out to be a linear transformation, and we can find the standard matrix for that linear transformation simply by describing what that linear transformation does to our standard basis vectors E1 and E2. So using a little bit of trigonometry, what we know is that this point right here, this is the point where we started with is 1, 0, and if we rotate counterclockwise by 60 degrees, what we end up with is 1 half comma square root of 3 over 2. And this point up here is the point 0, 1, and if we rotate counterclockwise by 60 degrees, again using a little bit of trigonometry, what we get is minus radical 3 over 2, comma 1 half. So remember, the standard basis for a linear transformation, the columns of that standard matrix, are the effects that T has on the standard basis vectors. So T of x here is A times x. And the matrix A, the columns of that matrix, are T of E1 and T of E2. So in this case, that's 1 half radical 3 over 2. That first column is t of e1. And then the second column is minus radical 3 over 2, 1 half. That's t of e2.
And so that describes this transformation in matrix form, which makes it much, much easier to figure out what T does to any of the vectors that we might look at in the plane R2. And there wasn't really anything special about that angle 60 degrees. In fact, we can do the same process and figure out the standard matrix for any counterclockwise rotation of any number of degrees. In this case, I'm using the Greek letter phi to represent how many degrees we have. And that's going to be represented by this matrix transformation. So again, having the standard matrix makes it much easier to actually compute the effect. So if we had any vector in the plane and we wanted to rotate it by any angle, the fastest, most efficient way to do that would be to construct this matrix and multiply the vector by this matrix.